And as authorities work to gather evidence of possible war crimes, one place they're looking is social media. NBC News senior reporter Ben Collins broke the story that four House committee chairpersons have asked YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, and Facebook to preserve all content that could be used as evidence of Russian war crimes in Ukraine. And Ben Collins joins us now. Ben, when people scroll through their timelines and their social media feeds and see firsthand reports of killings, rapes, and other possible war crimes in Ukraine, I mean, I don't think you're thinking in that moment that, oh, like, we should, I should favorite this and save it for a possible war crimes tribunal in the future. So lay this out for us. What kinds of posts on social media could be used as evidence? And why is it so important for social media companies themselves to archive these images? Yeah, it's not only us, you and I, who are going through those uh, photos and videos. It's also Facebook's uh, moderation machines, like the automated machines that go through this and try to flag violent content and take them down before most people see them. They are doing that. They are taking down these videos of, of atrocities uh, because that's what they're meant to do. Um, it's, you know, in things like mass shootings, uh, these come down quicker uh, because it works, the system works. But in terms of, you know, war crimes trials, you need these things to still exist so independent researchers can flag them, uh, grab them, and show them at trials in the future. And that's what we've uh, that's what we've learned in the last couple of days. You know, the House Oversight Committee, the House Foreign Affairs uh, Committee, both came together and said, look, you guys need to start preserving this stuff. You don't, you don't need to show it to your users necessarily, but you need to make an archive out of it for any future uh, U.S. investigation into Russian war crimes. What's fascinating about this is it's not just the posts of potential war crimes and human rights violations. Your reporting um, talks about conspiracy theories and misinformation, uh, uh, questioning specifically things like the massacre in Bucha, um, that were shared more often on Facebook than posts claiming the slaughter actually occurred. I mean, help us understand how misinformation on social platforms about war crimes are also being archived uh, and, and factor into this larger, I, I suppose, record that we're trying to create here. Yeah, it's another instance of those systems that were supposed to protect users were actually doing the opposite because... Uh, you know, you saw those horrific videos from Bucha of of that of that massacre that happened there. But you uh, you may have saw it on Twitter or you know other other websites. But Facebook deprioritized those videos. They they pushed them back or they took them down entirely, uh, largely by mistake. The hashtag Bucha was actually uh, dis like banned from search for a minute there. Facebook admitted it was a mistake, but because of that, in the week afterwards, according to ISD, which is a nonprofit that tra that tracks this stuff. Um, conspiracy theories about Bucha saying it didn't happen, say it was all saying it was all false flag or maybe the Ukrainians did it. Those received more play on Facebook, uh, you know, in the numbers of the hundreds of thousands of posts and shares uh, than the actual reality that was going on there. So, again, it was a it was a situation where it was trying to protect users, but it actually fed them conspiracy theories instead. How new is using social media postings um, as evidence in these war crimes tribunals? Um, compared to, I suppose, the past where they would use documents and photographs and reporting? It's kind of new, but people are getting very good at it. Um, Russia has actually outlined the playbook by mistake in Syria, um, in part because, you know, all of the collection, the data collection from Syria that proved these war crimes that they were trying to hide in the past, uh, you know, they, they're they doing the same stuff, basically, in Ukraine. So researchers at places like Bellingcat and also places like the New York Times, even, um, they they know where to look and they know the narratives that Russians are going to push to say that this didn't happen, that this was a false flag or something like that. And they know to just look past those narratives. So it's, you know, it is new. The collection of this stuff in a war crimes trial, it would be brand new, especially, you know, whenever this ends, if this ever ends. Uh, bringing this to a criminal court, it's going to be different in the age of deep fakes and things like that. But marking them in the moment, you know, saying that this was posted on this day using this metadata, uh, making it so it's quantifiable uh, is is very important. And that's that's what these letters are all about. So in the last minute here, I mean, what's the response from the companies? You think they'll comply with these kinds of requests? Uh, typically, they do. It's these are not really that binding. Um, they can be. They can be made binding. But uh, you know, they say you know they they have the ability to enforce this stuff. And um, it's one of those things. Twitter and Facebook, uh, probably TikTok, who also got one of these letters in Google. They generally want to help with this stuff. 
um, I think they made mistakes and they admitted to them. There's not, you know, when Facebook makes mistakes, uh, they don't usually admit to stuff. In the last month or two, they realized this is a grave situation. Uh, I think they will probably comply with these requests. And Collins, thank you so much. Fascinating conversation. Please stay safe. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.